If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Take it from me. I've been dreaming about doing a podcast for years, and I thought there's no way I could do this. But let me explain. First of all, it's free. And all their creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. It couldn't be any easier. Anchor will also distribute your podcast for you. It can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And this is cool. You can make money from your podcast. Got your passion, want to share it with the world, good advice, tips, whatever it might be. Because here's the cool part. There is no minimum number of listeners. You actually can make money off of that with Anchor. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. On this episode of Scandalabra. No. <laughs> yeah, what, what's your thought on that? That has to go. That has to go. We have a, a, a list of must goes. And uh, when, when you're with a new per- partner, it's at least the mattress. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scandalabra, the ugly truth behind beautiful spaces. I am thrilled in so many ways to have our first guest on today. She is not only the author of five best-selling books, including Downsizing the Family Home and Downsizing the Blended Home, her syndicated column, At Home with Marnie Jameson, appears weekly in more than 20 papers across the country. But more importantly, she's a mom, a stepmom to five grown children. She lives in Florida with her husband and three dogs. See, I knew I loved you right away. You have three dogs. Hey, Marnie, welcome to the show. Mark, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So I just have to confess, we've courted professionally for what, 10 years at, at least, least, right? And yeah. uh, we've never met. So I, I, I'm curious, ridiculous. have we been practicing social distancing way before a pandemic? <laughs> I think or, before it was in fashion, yeah. Or, or are all your relationships like this? No, no, no. You're unique, Mark. <laughs> um, you know, I think about it uh, as a writer, you probably interview and talk to so many people from around the country, around the world, and you have these amazing moments. But at the end of the day, you know, you might be missing that connection. And so I hope one day we get to meet in person. But for now, let's make that happen. This I'm, is ridiculous. Yeah. We've got to stop meeting like this. I know. I'm thrilled you're on the show. So I, I want to start with uh, the end of your last book. Okay. That sounds crazy because we're, it sounds yeah. like we're going backwards, yeah. but there's a, an amazing quote from Maya Angelou. And I, I want to talk about it as a framework for what we talk about today. She writes, we are gone from this world for longer than we are here. So why not aspire to make a mark on the world that can't be erased? Let's talk about that. You know, so much of our lives are focused on the here and the now, which I think we all would agree it's important to be present. Um, but it seems like we invest so much in a place that may or may not have a lasting, a lasting effect. How has that inspired your writing? Wow, it's such a rick. When you read the quote, even though I've seen it before, obviously I got chills. It's it's so important for us to remember our legacy. And I think that is where the latest book I have written, What to Do with Everything You Own to Leave the Legacy You Want, comes in. And you and I have been masters of decluttering and downsizing. We've, we've written about it. We've talked about it and helped other people through that journey. But in a very existential way, once we cross that finish line at the end of our journey here, how our how the dominoes fall and how we leave this world is really what matters and what we are doing right now helping people live better lives modeling a better way to be a better way to live a better way to give and you've done amazing things in that realm with your design for folks who really can appreciate it and need it uh, is far more important I think than the immediate aesthetic so I learned a lot as I, I was asked to write that book. It wasn't my idea. I wish it were, but it's that the ultimate downsize and, and how do you leave uh, your legacy, whether it's the, your will to your children or to causes that are important to you? How do you make sure your collections and your beloved belongings fall in the right hands, the cherished heirlooms from your parents 
or your family, how do you bestow them in a proper way, uh, takes thought. And it's not to burden the next generation, for sure. You want to be very well edited and very tight. And, and, and as you ta- taught me, Mark, it's the stories that we convey. And everything has a story. But when we everything has a story and you convey everything, it loses its meaning. So you have to edit and be intentional. That's a lot to start off, to start off with. But it really makes you think about how your efforts today, the ripple effects that they will have on the generations to come. That is so excellent. And you've touched on so many amazing points. The first of which is you say it's more than the aesthetics. That's that's what Scandalabra is all about. It's more than the pretty picture. And oftentimes it's not an ugly truth behind it, but there is a truth behind it. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Why do people just not plan? Why do people not plan an estate? Uh, <laughs> why do they not take the time to do what you're talking about? I think it's a couple things. One is, you know, I, I don't know about you, but while I was growing up, I pretty much thought, nobody died. And then I thought, well, maybe two out of 10 people died, but certainly nobody I knew. And then my parents died. I went, shoot, maybe it's maybe three out of 10 die, actually, maybe, maybe more, but not me, you know, so I think we just don't want to admit that we're mortal too. And eventually you come to terms with, you know, yeah, that meteor might strike you one day. And if you haven't made a plan, then you basically left it up to the state to do it for you. Other people say, uh, I don't have enough. I don't have enough to leave behind. Um, I don't have any real value worth or whatever. But if you don't do it, the state will do it for you. And I think you're going to be able to do a better job than the government in general. And you you do need to have a, a, even a simple will. It doesn't have to be complicated to make sure there's no fighting. And I mean, I have in writing this last book, uh, I, I talked to many families and lawyers who had seen the worst of people. It's the worst of people come out when someone dies and there's money left behind and and there's been no plan and no conversation. So one of the things I talk about is how important it is to have that conversation because what happens when the parents die, it's I always knew mom loved you more, you know, or dad favored you, you got the, the car and I got the the crummy Tupperware, you know, I don't know what you got. It. I don't know. I think it's living well now. So everything seamlessly falls into place. So Marnie, do you think people are afraid of death? I think so. I like to think of it as going to sleep and not waking up, but that's a little terrifying, I guess. Um, I think it's a lot harder on the people you leave behind. And if if you love, if you have loved ones, you don't want them to be left without you if you know you're bringing value to their lives and I um, married a widower my husband lost his first wife to cancer and nobody saw it coming it was 17 days after her diagnosis and left a hole in this world that I could never fill Um, you know left three three children grown children without a mom she won't see her grandchildren and that sort of thing and I I watched the aftermath of that and it's really hard. It's hard to see that and, and how my uh, my dear husband has dealt with that and grown through that. And I don't think it's a place that um, we can ever fully imagine until it's happened to us. I, know, I don't know if you have your parents. I, I watched both of them die. They lived beautifully long lives and they filled, they completed their arc, but it's still devastating. Yes. Uh, both my parents are alive. So I've yet to go through that. Um, I certainly have lost loved ones. And one of the things that I learned early on, as you referenced earlier, you know, it's never really about the dining room set, the vase or any of that. It's the what it represents. It's the vase is resentment. The dining room set is favoritism. (laughs) You know, it's all those things. And I think life is complicated enough. Wouldn't you agree? Why would you want to extend and complicate those stories and those relationships. You talk about families that argue and fight over things. Uh, I, I've seen it firsthand. I, I call it the house of greed. And um, if anything, your book may, takes such strides to steer people away from that. Um, what, what would you say is one uh, story or family story or just experience you had in talking to people and writing this book that really was uh, disheartening, you know, that really turned out not to be so great? Well, 
I, there's one story I talk about. Uh, I called the fellow by a name that is his. It's, I call him Charlie Quinn because he asked me not to use his name. But he was one of four siblings and his parents lived a, a good life and they, they collected some, some money over the time. Not an extraordinary amount, but a reasonable amount. And they had four children. And the plan was that they would divide the money that the family had amassed when the last parent died among the four children equally. And the dad, because he wanted to uh, not pay any taxes, put it all in all the cash in a safe deposit box. We're talking several hundred thousand dollars in a safe deposit box. He died first. The mom was still alive. She did die a few months later. But in the meanwhile, older sister says, I'll take care of mom and gets all the accounts moved over to her name. And when they went to the safe deposit boxes, they were empty. And she, you know, probably put it a hole in the backyard. We don't know. Um, but that was a great example of the great. And then lawsuits followed. And there were witnesses that there had been this money. Where to go? Don't put your cash in a safe deposit box. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Step one. Uh, don't try to beat the system. Um, anyway, so that's that's a terrible story. Destroyed a family and destroyed the potential for that money to do what the parents wanted it to do right. for those four people because of one person's greed. Lots of valuable lessons. Uh, so let's let me ask you this: Do you take your own advice? I mean, you give advice to <laughs> probably millions of people across the country every week. Um, do you walk your talk? I'm curious, and and I'll be the first to say: There's times when I do, and there's times when I don't. You know, um, I do my best, but I'm curious. Well, I I tell I sometimes confess in my column that I really need to take my own advice. So that's that's full disclosure. Um, I do look at my closet sometimes and say, dang, I it's time to thin out this these you know the shoe collection or I haven't worn this blouse in five years. What am I? What is this doing in my closet? Yes, um, but it, it does. It is a process, you know, living well downsizing, streamlining, decluttering. It's its a its a process. It's not a one and done. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of looking at things and trying to keep ahead of it. So yeah, I do attack every once in a while. I just attack the garage or I attack the pantry, but things creep up. And uh, I'll be the first to admit that there are places in my house that, you know, wouldn't you know, I would want to show off right away. But um, but I do know what I'm supposed to do. And I think that's step one, the awareness and um, I, I have a thanks to my husband who and this is kind of another thing that perpetuated the the legacy book the what to do with everything you own because he was a widower and had three children and I had two children when he's a lawyer when we got married he said we both need trusts and so he created a trust for his kids where his premarital assets would flow to them. I created a trust for my children. So my premarital assets would flow to them. And then we're building our own. And it's not huge amounts of money, but it's enough so the kids feel protected because he didn't want his kids to think, oh, there, there we go. There goes our inheritance. He remarried someone and she's going to take it all and give it to her kids. So that none of that's going to happen. None of that. There's Because he foresaw that there could be trouble unless we put up fences and make sure everything has been squared away. And it was a very good idea. So yeah, I walk the walk in that respect. Thanks to him. Something you say in the book that I love, trust create trust. And literally the hair in my arm stood up when I read that because I thought that's just brilliant. And I wish more people knew that. Yeah. I, a lot of people think it, trusts are for other people. It's really not. It's really, if you, if you want a sure hand on how, Things, and you can still access that. You can still access the money in in revocable trusts. You can you can use the money. You can. I've used my trust that I got from my parents, not a huge amount, but I've used it to buy housing for my two children who are getting doctorates, and they're both you know trying to get through grad school, and, and they're not making much money yet. And then when they're done and they move on, they'll sell that, and that money will go back into their trusts. So I'm able to use it as a steward for good and for their benefit. Um, so I think there's no question about, they don't feel it's, there's just, it, we created what Doug calls, my husband, Doug calls bright lines. It's very clear in the family where the lines are and there's a yours, mine and ours. And it's just, it's just transparent that way. And it, it's just create, it takes away all the finger pointing and avarice that could follow if, and he knows all too well that, 
people die when they shouldn't too prematurely. And so if one of us goes, everything's going to be okay. I mean, except for we'll miss each other, but financially, legally, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. And I think, and it takes planning. Yeah, it does take planning. Um, (laughs) Everything takes planning, but, but I think one of the things you've illuminated so well is that you have to plan your life when life is no longer with you. And um, I love that. And and in fact, I want to take a step back and really look at the whole uh, kind of trilogy of books, I'll call them, um, <laughs> because I feel like I've been a part of them from the beginning. And thank you for that. Um, you which really been. speaks to how we met. Uh, I, I was on clean house at the time and you were writing your first book, downsizing the family home. Um, and, uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Was that an idea of yours? Were uh-huh. you just like decided, I know you've written books previously, but was it topical? Was it ripped from the headlines? What was going on in your life? <laughs> Well, that's a, a great story. And yes, you have been there from the very beginning, Mark. So um, gosh, back in 2013 or 14, my parents who had gotten to be quite elderly were moving out of their home where they had lived for 50 years and into assisted living. They're both 89. And their house was in California and I'm in Florida. And my brother's in California and he was taking care of the legal aspects and, and f- helping them relocate. And I was in charge of the family home. And I thought, no problem. It's a little house, but it's where they lived for almost 50 years. The only house I ever knew. And I said, I'll just take a week off work. I was a reporter at the Orlando Sentinel. I'll just fly in. I'll clean out the house, get it on the market. It, you know, big deal, right? So I walk in and I'm in charge of, of cleaning out this entire family home. And it was le- like I stepped in quicksand and then a giant grabbed my ankles and I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. It was such an emotional, such a weight. I had no idea. And I'm a practical get it done kind of person, but I was I, I was just flattened by this, this task. And I started writing about it in my weekly column. Wouldn't you agree about- though that a lot of people, especially now as our population gets out more it gets older. Wouldn't you agree that a lot of people are having that experience? I don't think any of us gets out alive without this, without going through this right. once, at least once, whether it's your parent or your, or your in-laws or your aunt, or your uncle, your grandparents, we all, someone's good. It was the first time I had to confront this and it was so difficult. And I was, as I said, I was writing about it in my column and I was getting an avalanche of emails from my readers. I knew I'd hit a nerve. They're like, Marnie, we're saving all these columns. We're going through the same thing. I wish I had your columns three years ago. I, you know, can you put these all in a book for me? Cause I'm about to go through this myself. And I knew having written two books that this was something to write about. So I, I went through the process and I was writing about it. It was heartbreaking. And I think Marcus, you're, you'll be appreciate this, but the books out there on estate planning or on downsizing or on cleaning out a family home or selling an estate, they're very dry. Mm -hmm. They're, they're written by people who profit from selling estates and say, Oh, let us, let us do it. We'll take 30%. You don't worry your pretty little head. I didn't have nothing to gain. I'm just saying, this is really hard. I cried when I saw a crocodile purse that my mom took to a fancy dinner and the menu was still inside. I mean, I'll cry right now. It was just so heartbreaking. And so I guess I, I was channeling what so many people were going through and writing it in my weekly column. And I told my agent about it and she had the good idea of getting AARP to weigh in on it. I was thinking this is for middle-aged people writing about their senior parents. And she's like, no, this is also for their senior parents to give this book to their adult children. So it's there are two audiences here. And then you you were, came on the scene. I read your book, Taking the You Out of Clutter, and thought this guy gets it. You are helping me on the journey and brilliantly wrote the foreword for that book, which I loved and was just such a wonderful addition. And and so that's how that that got started. I did not come into this business by this downsizing world on purpose. I was I was unwittingly drawn into it. I was interested in home design. I'd been writing about home design and lifestyle. And man, I just fell into this whole world of downsizing and it it opened a lot of eyes for me and a lot of doors. And then when I remarried Doug, who we're both been in our, in our 50s, and we get remarried, and he had a fully loaded house. His wife had died. Nothing had changed since she left. I had a fully loaded house. And when two houses and two houses get together, they need to equal one house. 
and we each need to, to get rid of half a house. And so I was like, oh, honey, I got this. I'm the home design expert. I've been staging houses. You know, I've got great taste. You just go to work and, you know, practice law and I'll take care of that. <laughs> okay, okay. First Please. of all, let me just say, we know <laughs> that that's not always the case. Look, I'm a designer. I've been married now. We're going on 22 years. It took me three years to find a dining room table that we actually like. So really, I mean, we think we walk around with this body of expertise and like, oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I can handle it. But when it's you and your life and your relationship and now your husband's kids and your kids, everything changes, right? Mm hmm. Oh, my gosh. Everything's charged and it's emotional. And and I just like I like my furniture and his I didn't like. I loved him, but his furniture, not so much. Right. So <laughs> but he said he had the very wise words. He said, I don't want to feel like I'm living in your house. Like that was kind of like the ice bucket challenge. I'm like, OK, so then I so that's when I wrote downsizing the blended home. How do you get rid of really? a whole house, two plus one plus one has to equal one. So we have to get rid of a bunch of stuff here. And dirty little secret, you've got to get rid of more than a house because you also need to get some stuff together sure. that you both like that unify and bridge your, your, your book, your look. So that's was a natural evolution from downsizing the family home came downsizing the blended home. And that's, I think it's just so important when couples come together that one person doesn't just move over their clothes in the closet and make room for the other person. They have to like really blend their styles and their things and their stories and give up and shed their past and make and build their future. It's all metaphorical, you know that. Yeah. So um so then then that became as you pointed out the trilogy, the final one is like then what to do with everything. So you cross that finish line and you leave it all in a bow. You put a bow on the whole package. And uh, it's been quite a journey. I've learned a lot, you know, just thinking about it, asking, interviewing people like you, interviewing really wonderfully bright people in all walks of life and opening my eyes and, and trying out the advice. Some of it sounds silly and it doesn't really make sense, but I, I apply it. I think about it. I'm like, you know what? They're right about this. And I, and I try to be that conduit for my reader to, to kind of run the traps on this advice and tell them what I think really should stick. You know, you and I have talked, spoken about this many times before, uh, bringing two people together stylistically, I think the the big pitfall yeah. that people make is, you know, one guy speaking French and the partner speaking Italian, and they're trying to force each other to understand that language. But in reality, obviously, there needs to be some understanding of, of that, but you have to create a new language. You know, it's time mm -hmm. to learn Spanish, <laughs> you know, to use yeah. the metaphor. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what you're touching on, which is so true and so amazing. Now I'm going to get down and dirty on you for a second because uh -oh. in all the, my years on Clean House, one of the things I was always taken by was people who had been previously married, married and still had the bed that they slept in with their people. No. <laughs> yeah, what, what's your thought on that? That has to go. That has to go. We have a, a, a list of must goes. And uh, when, when you're with a new per partner, it's at least the mattress and the bedding I agree. <laughs> at the very least, but we opted for a whole new bed <laughs> and a mattress and the whole, the whole shoot match. So absolutely new bedding and a new mattress, please. And then it's nice if you, uh, you know, can get a new bed. Yeah, Good advice. Yeah. Hey everyone. I want to take a moment to thank Misio home for supporting Scandalabra. Imagine having access to the creative minds of the world's best artisans, designers, and dreamers. Nisio Home was launched for design-savvy enthusiasts just like you and me, because we appreciate original works, quality materials, and above all, how our home makes us feel. And now we have a very special code from Nisio that will get you, our listeners, 20% off. Just use the word podcast at checkout, and you will receive 20% off on your next purchase. Thank you, Nisio. That's M I S S I O home.com. Um, so uh, you talk a lot about in this book uh, what to do with everything you own to leave the legacy you want. And one of the things you really place a lot of emphasis on is charitable giving. Um, you create a lot of scenarios that uh, are very doable. One of the ones I love is if you have three children, just pretend you have four. You know, it's like that simple. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you've already talked a little bit about how your trusts and money that's in your hands contributes to your kids now in grad school and all that. Um, but I guess my question comes, uh, were you, do most people give to charities 
Uh, I, I know we're hitting record numbers with the amount of money that's being donated to charities. Is it really in people's mindset or are they just more concerned about their lives, their family and their world? The latter. Um, a, a, a surprisingly few number of people, even very wealthy people, leave anything when they die to charity. They tend to give it when they're alive and they don't seem to remember that in their passing. And it's an it's a missed opportunity. Even five percent would go a long way because as you read in the book, I love the story of the school teacher. There's a single school teacher who lived in the Ozarks, and she had a very modest house worth about sixty five thousand dollars, and she left it all to the community foundation for this for the, the Ozarks, and they took that. And she said, "I want to help other kids get an education." And so she was all she, all of her life. She was a teacher. Didn't have much. They grew that into a hundred thousand dollars, and now that's a scholarship. That goes out a scholarship every single year and will into perpetuity because they manage the money, they manage the scholarship fund, and she didn't have a lot. But it's it's her legacy is wonderful. She's helping children and and students for many many years to come. So it's just a little bit can go a long way toward. If you have always given a few hundred dollars a year to a particular charity and you take that number in one time and you multiply it by 10, just one time, and let that be an annuity, like says $2,500, and put that into a fund, that'll throw off that same $200 that you, $250 you've been giving all your life. It'll continue to give $250 if you put it into a a foundation's hand so you can give long after you're gone. And I just think that's one of the big reasons that I have wrote this book. I didn't think about that. And I I didn't, I didn't plan on that. I mean, I do give to charities as I'm alive, but it's it's not, you've got to build it in and and it it can have such a lasting difference. Yeah. You can set up a, a beautiful botanical garden that'll give beautiful moments for people for, for years and years to come long after you're gone. And there's just so many ways you can leave a, le- a legacy beyond your children who you should take care of and, um, and your grandchildren. But the studies show that most people don't leave anything. And if you, if you're, you have grandchildren, you leave even less because you tend to leave to your family and your grandchildren, but just a little bit off for, for charity. It's good modeling. Cause then maybe they'll do the same thing. And, um, and it really make a lasting difference. Well, you're speaking to something that you wrote about in the book called Your Legacy Will Be Measured Not By Its Size, But By Its Influence. I thought that was really profound. Mm-hmm. Uh, so often, I think there's a mindset, at least party of one over here, that you know when I pass away, I'm just gone. I'm erased. I'm done. That's it. My time was what it was, and my contribution yeah. was what it was, and there's a, it's finite. There's a beginning and an end. But what you're pointing to in the book, and I, which I think is so beautiful because I really think I think it speaks to so many other things about our spirits and how we, you know, we're in this infinite world and universe. Um, it's not over. You know, just because I might not physically be here, my presence and ability to make a difference can live as long as I intend it to. Absolutely. And I think that is is something that we we think, oh, only you have to be wealthy to make this big difference. No, you can do these little make these little moves that have these perpetuating effects. And I you know I've I haven't set up that part of my legacy yet because I'm I'm bracing for that question. Um, so what have you done? But I'm thinking about it and I would I would like to help women in journalism who are who are writing columns about life and lifestyle have subsidy because the newspaper will start going away and and how do they how do they get subsidized and and be able to write with a voice that influences the next generation is that curing cancer no is that providing scholarships no is that taking care of racial inequity no all those things are important but i find it meaningful to help other women follow in my footsteps and maybe Maybe it'll be a, a you know a Marnie Jameson fund that just helps women years after I'm gone write and communicate and share their stories. Amen, Marnie. I think if I can extract from anything from what you just said, it's this idea that when you answer that question, as you said for yourself, you absolutely the place to look is what you are passionate about, what you are aligned with, mm-hmm. what matters to you. 
Um, and I think that's great. You know, um, I I've always said the meaning of life is to find your gift, but the purpose of life is to give it away. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm curious, were you one of those quiet little kids who like started writing poetry at a really young age, you know, and have you always been introverted and a writer? You're not introverted now. So I'm just wondering, <laughs> has writing been in your blood and DNA or is it something you came to in your life? Well, I guess I find a, on an introvert extrovert scale, I'm in the middle. I uh, I do like people, but I do like to be you know reflective. Um, but I did I have to admit started this very early. I have journals that go back to when I was six or seven, and I was getting the purple journal with the purple pen because the color was important. Mark and um, and then I had a brother. Yes, it had to match. <laughs> and I had an orange pen for my orange journal. And there we were. But um, I was writing really stupid things uh, for most of my young life, writing journals. And I, it was important to me just to write down, just to write. And uh, and I remember my brother was musical. I am not. I can't play anything but the radio. And he uh, he was a major rocker in L.A. He was actually an opening act for Eddie Van Halen. So, I mean, I'm talking a real rock and roller. And um, he used to get albums back in the day. And he would come home with a new album and he'd be playing his guitar. And I just put, put earplugs in and I sat on the, his bed and read the lyrics. I just wanted to know. I loved wordplay. I loved reading the words. I loved. I still love language, and I, I need to see it and see how they go together and how they resonate. I didn't care about the music. I like cared about the words. So, I guess when I look back, I can see it now um, how it, how it was in me. And I'll, then for you, Mark, like you, I, my I tell my girls, your job is to figure out your gift and give it back to the world to make it better. And I wanted to figure out where my gifts intersected the marketplace because I also need to support myself. So as a writer, I had to figure out, well, what do I major in journalism? And then I better go into some kind of paying journalism. So I went into a newsroom and wrote for magazines, wrote a long time for the L.A. Times and wrote a lot for Women's Day and Family Circle and Child. And I was writing a lot what other people wanted me to write. OK, I had a PR firm. I wrote for lots of medical professionals, getting them going. I just wanted to be paid and have an audience for, for my writing. And that was kind of my goal. Sure. And then eventually I stumbled into the column and I get the best of both worlds. But I paid my dues and I get to write what I want to write. You write for the Orlando Sentinel, which uh, in my understanding is over 100 years old, probably 140 plus. Um, any pressure doing that? You know, it's an institution. I know it's evolved, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, that's a big deal. So, yes, I mean, and, and I, I don't work for them anymore. They do carry my column. So they're on the same plane as the 20 so other papers that run my column. Um, I think I felt that gravitas more when I was writing for the L.A. Times, which I started writing for in 1995. And I mean, I, this was the paper that I saw on my doorstep as a little girl, right, growing up. And then and then now I'm writing for it. And that felt enormous to me. Um, they happen to be owned by the same parent company, Tribune Media, owned the LA Times and the Orlando Sentinel, which is how I got transferred across the country to work in the newsroom at the Orlando Sentinel. I know I have a, I run a nonprofit, so I'm out of the newsroom in another, another day job, but they do carry my column. And I think, you know, I think one of the reasons I, I left was because I saw so many layoffs. And I think if anything, Mark, I feel sad to see the journalism going away and, and the print news as we know it. And, and I get times change and life evolves, but they're struggling. They're really, str newspapers are really struggling. And I don't know what the answer is. We need good journalists and we need them to be paid well and they need to be objective and they need to tell stories and they need to keep us um, informed objectively as they can. They're not always objective as we know, but just to get all of our information off of blogs isn't... Um, going to give us that editorial objectivity that good papers have have given us for so long. So I don't know if it answers your question, but I think that I feel a responsibility to good journalism and I and I would like to see it perpetuated in some way. Uh, and I, I, I hope I contribute. I think I feel responsible as a journalist to continue to communicate and elevate my readers' lives and minds. And it's nothing I ever take lightly, the fact that so many papers subscribe to my weekly column and I, I do have an impact on people's lives. And, and they'll tell me when I've crossed the line, boy, they'll tell me when I've offended them. And um, it keeps me honest. 
I love that you're a wordsmith because I, I'm reminded of Amanda Gorman, whom I'm sure you know who is, the poet. And, um, you know, there was an interview with her and she said something really that, that kind of struck me, which is when she researches a pro product or a project or anything she's going to write about, she doesn't look at any visuals. She just only reads what's been written about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think about you as you write your column you don't really rely on visuals and that's not what your column's about. Um, mm -hmm. And, but you're utilizing words to convey an idea. Um, do you ever have writer's block? Do you ever have a loss <laughs> for words? Do you ever think, <laughs> what do I want to say here? I don't know. Yes. The weekly deadline cures that quickly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Knowing that, for 17 years, every single week, I have managed to get that that column filed. I last weekend I filed it at 11:58 p.m., but it was before midnight. <laughs> so I'm a professional. I get it done. Uh, absolutely, you know, my husband would say I'm never to lost for words, but it's but it's true that I am. Um, and I have taught writing. I taught writing for nine years at UCLA, and I will tell them, my students, if you don't know where to start, start in the middle. I like that. So start give, give me an example of that. Know. Start mm -hmm. that. There you go. That's it right there. Start in a place you know. I, mm -hmm. I think writer's block is the writer's duty and obligation to learn more about the world they're writing about. And so if they don't know something, they're going to get stopped. But that advice is so awesome because if you start from what you know, then it blossoms and it grows. I think people need, you know, you want to have a really arresting lead. You want to have a, a, an opening that grabs people and carries them through. And that's such an, uh, a burden to try to come up with that right out of the gate. So just figure out that the lead will bubble up. Your opening will declare itself and start at something you know you're going to say. And the other thing, I have two more things to give yourself permission for. One is know that your first draft is terrible. <laughs> Give yourself to to write something terrible. My, I hope nobody kills me between my first draft and my second because I would be embarrassed to leave that as a legacy, right? It's about the time, the third draft, that it starts to take shape. And you just have to have patience with the process and know that it's terrible. I, I once heard an interview with J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author, and uh -huh. she somebody said, How, what makes you such a great writer? And she said, because I really know when my writing is really bad. And God bless her, because we all write terrible stuff. And then you just be a good writer recognizes that and they keep pushing through and making it better. And that's the craft. So one is give yourself permission to write a really bad first draft and a mediocre second draft. The second, third thing I would say is it's OK to do nothing. I mean, it's OK if you don't have anything. Writer's block. I always say, well, I'm going to I'm going to put this job to the ghostwriter in the basement. And I walk after, I take a shower, I take a walk, I have a cup of tea, I play with my dogs, I have a conversation with a friend, I do something. And my subconscious is working all, If once I've dumped all the facts in and I don't really know how I'm going to approach my subject, I let it percolate. And sometimes sleeping on it, if you have the luxury of that time, just to, to start the next morning fresh, let it all, your subconscious is working all the time. And I have leaned on that more than I would like to admit but I, I trust it and it will, it will come up with the answers, but you need to give it, writing takes space and time. So give, give yourself a little bit of, of room to have your subconscious work on the, work out the kinks. I love that. I love that. Uh, trust yourself. That's so hard. You know, when I first started doing makeover television, I would, this is going to sound silly, but I put up a wall color and everybody would walk around and be like, Ooh, the homeowners are not going to like that. And I I'd, I'd go home every night and think, Oh my gosh, do I need to change that? What do I need to do? Well, I'll cut to the chase here. What I eventually came to where I came to was this point when I decided I had to get behind myself. I had to trust myself. I had to believe that what I was doing was right. And it was the most appropriate thing. And once that moment happens, it just seems like the world opens up. There's a lot of freedom and expression around that. And I get a lot of that in your books because A, you're not only really telling your story. In many ways, I see the books you've written as a, uh, an autobiography, you know, yeah. about you. It's your life. It's your life on the page. But then you're able to take it and make it 
digestible, make it palatable for people to understand and learn and say, oh, I can do that. And I think if anything I've learned from all your books, but more importantly, this last one, is that it's there are a lot of like the ideas are not grand and lofty. They're just really simple and easy, you know, mm -hmm. and the littlest of things really do make a difference. And I can see that in your stories. I see it in your writing. I hear it in your voice. And I love that you're living that life because, I mean, that's a life well lived. Thank you, Mark. Well, I, I hope I, I, I never want to sound pretentious. I never want to talk down to my reader. I never want to sound like all that. And what gets me through is that I lean on experts like you. And in my book, I've had you're in my new book, by the way, you, you probably saw that I squirted you in there. Okay. There's no escaping thank, me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, lawyers, uh, folks who've been through a lot of estate planning, um, folks who have given, uh, figured out their own trusts and wills and their own legacies. Uh, I lean on everyone to teach me and show me the way. And uh, I'm never the, I'm never the know-it-all. I'm never the expert. I'm just the girl next door who's two steps ahead of you, figuring it out as I go and hoping to you know, smooth the way for you a little bit. Well, yes, you were the girl next door who color coordinated <laughs> their pens to their <laughs> journals. I guess I was the boy next door who folded my dirty laundry. That's a confession. <laughs> um, perhaps that showed up later in my life somehow. So, Marnie, I, I have a question for you. If the Marnie of today could give advice to the younger Marnie, what would it be? Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, you know, my dad used to say, and this is coming home to me, is the things we worry about rarely happen. So I think not to be so fearful. And uh, I, you know, I worried a lot. I stressed a lot about, you know, is my career going to work out? Are my kids going to work out? You know, is life going to work out? And it works out, you know, I'm, uh, it works out. So <laughs> things fall into place. Um, the universe is good. The world is good, a good place. It's been, I've been blessed, but I think that if we, um, I really, I really have come to believe in a little bit of manifestation. If you envision what you want, it comes to you and it may not come to you in the way you expect it, but um, I've just, I think I would not have been so hard on myself. I would have just relaxed and enjoyed the ride a little bit more. Yeah. Well, thank you for being so fearless, you know, um, in the face <laughs> of that. fear I, and that's not easy. And thank you to your father for his service. Um, and um you know, I, I, I've so enjoyed this time together. And so I appreciate you, Marnie, and I hope we get to hug it out real soon. I hope so. Thank you so much, Mark. Pre-order, order, whatever it takes. This fantastic book, What to Do with Everything You Own to Leave the Legacy You Want. We will have a link in our show notes to get all the information on Marnie. This has been an MBU production. To learn more, go to markburnettes.com. That's M-A-R-K. B-R-U-N-E-T-Z dot com.